In this episode of Mind Pump, we answer questions asked by listeners like you. They go to our Instagram page, Mind Pump Media. They post a question under the Qua meme. We pick the best ones and then we answer them. But the way we open the episode is with introductory fun conversation. We bring up studies. We talk about our sponsors and we talk about our lives. So here's what we talked about in this episode. We start out by talking about our favorite candy bars. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Uh, fitness podcast, talking about our favorite candy bars. I mean, you then, know, we're human beings. Then we talked about our time in Las Vegas recently. We went to go see the Bill Burr comedy show. It was hilarious. Doug got destroyed and smashed. It was a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> he loves when you bring that up. Then I talked about the study that connected dark humor to high IQ. So uh, for those of you that look at my memes and think... <laughs> Sal, you're Self terrible. Selection uh, studies again. There you huh? go. Yep. <laughs> I talked about how Tesla's stock is roaring and crushing. Looks like their ugly truck, quote unquote. So apparently that means we're wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, Adam. You. Yeah. Okay. They're crushing. Sure. Then we talked about the documentary on Netflix called "Don't Fuck with Cats." Proceed with caution. It is a disturbing. Uh, show to watch, uh, but it's uh, also quite Not interesting. Not Christmas material. Uh, that led us to talk about serial killers. Um, I talked about having vegan protein in Vegas uh, from a company that was not Organifi, and I was quickly reminded why Organifi is the company we work with. Their protein powder is the best quality, and it tastes the best. By the way, we have a discount for you. If you go to Organifi.com forward slash Mind Pump and use the code Mind Pump, you'll get 20% off their protein powder and all of their other organic products. Then we talked about how millennials are leaving religion uh, like crazy, and we talked about what that could potentially look like. And then we mentioned our favorite Christmas movies. Then we got into the questions. The first question was, this person wants to know if it would be beneficial to train entirely unilateral for a while. Now, unilateral training means training one arm or one leg at a time. So rather than using barbells, using dumbbells, or instead of doing squats, doing lunges, we talk about all the benefits of doing so. The next question, this person wants to know how reliable it is to judge your progress based on muscle soreness. So we talk all about muscle soreness, what it means and what it doesn't mean, and we talk about the myths surrounding muscle soreness. The third question, this person wants to know all about box squats and if they, if they have any value. So should you add box squats into routine or traditional squats enough? And the final question, this person wanted to know what some of the things are that have caused the modern obesity epidemic. Also, four days left. There's only four days left for MAPS Aesthetic. What's this for? 50% off. MAPS Aesthetic is a phenomenal body sculpting, body building program. So it's a full workout with video demos and workout descriptions. You go in there, you follow it, but you also pick out your particular weak body part. So let's say... You want to train your whole body, but you have special focus for your back. Your back is underdeveloped. You do what are called focus sessions, which are specific to MAPS Aesthetic for your back. So in other words, MAPS Aesthetic is modifiable based on your body, allowing you to sculpt your body the way you see fit. Again, it's 50% off. There's only four days left. Here's how you get the discount. Go to mapsblack.com and use the code BLACK50. B L A C K five zero no space for the discount. Sal, what'd you get? What did I what? What'd you get her? What did I get, Jessica? Yeah. Uh, a what you might call it? A uh, wedding band. A what no. you might call it? That, yeah, for Chris. Hey, Merry Christmas. Have you ever had? Have you ever had that uh, candy bar? What you might call it? What you might call it? I did. Was that a commercial? It wasn't as good as you as you think, though. I don't know. It was pretty good. It was like, you, a little bit of a crunch in there, and it's like uh, like a poor man's Kit Kat. Do you know what my <laughs> yes. Yeah. Do you know what's you know what my favorite candy is though my favorite candy bar. Which Let's one? talk about our favorite candy bars. It's a good okay. topic. I already know what Justin's is. Yeah, I mean, what's that's, his? He had a, a peanut butter peanut butter Snickers. Damn it, peanut butter Snickers. Yeah, he had is that your favorite He's, candy bar? <laughs> <laughs> what happened? That's right. You weren't around, dude. Yeah, yeah. When we were when we were sitting around in the uh, airport. Uh, airport, I was like, I walked right past it, and I was like, oh my god. And I just impulse just kicked in. <laughs> I actually I don't think it. I've ever had one. Why did you sound oh. horny right now? Did you get horny for it? Yeah, yeah. I did get horny because like, oh. I didn't. So I, I've always been a Reese's guy. And then Halloween came around and I was stealing candy from the kids. And I stole one of those uh, Snickers bars that had peanut butter. And it was like fucking amazing. So I had to get it. I've never had one. Have so, you had one? Yeah, they're good. 
Oh, you've they're had good. one. Yeah, they're good. Uh, you know which one's my favorite? You know, for a health ambassador, you've had a lot more candy than I have, I feel like. <laughs> um, He's all into the hard candy. I don't, I don't think so. <laughs> hard, I, don't, I, don't hard, I don't know what that means. but No, I like the gummy stuff. It's true. I am the ambassador of health, though. Still <laughs> haven't. <laughs> you haven't <laughs> lost <laughs> your ribbon? Did, 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 did. No, yeah. uh, Baby Ruth. Baby mm, Ruth? Baby Ruth? Love Baby Ruth. No. I Ruth. know, it's so simple, too. It's just... No. It's just Caramel nugget and it covered in peanuts, but the saltiness. Some nugget. So you like peanuts. paydays then too, right? Paydays are also good. Yeah. Yeah, I love them. What's yeah. your favorite? Uh, too much peanuts. You know what's funny? I'm not a big candy bar guy. I'm trying to remember. Whatever. You, you Pick know, your as, a, as a kid, I was. Uh, I love Butterfinger. No, you're a good mm. and plenty guy. I am a good plenty. If yeah. I was to have a, if I was to go have a candy now, you know what? That's an old. As I got older, it's an old thing. Yeah. yeah bla- I didn't like black licorice when I was a kid. No. You hate black licorice yeah. as a kid. No. Uh, yeah. But that's one of those weird things that when you get beyond thirty, all of a sudden that shit all changes. And yeah. You start, it's, like, it's like olives. I yeah. eat. Same I thing. Eat, but uh, good and plenty. So black licorice candy, which is weird. I never liked that as a kid. Uh, you know, uh, pecan ice cream. You know, mm, coconut ice that's, cream. That's all stuff you don't like when you're a kid. Yeah, yeah all the stuff I I used uh, to tease my grandparents for eating. Uh-huh. Going like, yeah, oh, it's old people ice cream. It's old people candy. Uh-huh. That's the shit I like now. Did you guys ever eat hundred grand? There's originals. <laughs> you ever yeah. see a hundred grand? Yeah, yeah. Those are not that good. You got to work on those for a while. A little bit. You get stuck in your teeth. No, the worst for that. The worst for that is, uh, what are they called? Jujubes? Yeah. Jujubes, dude. I used to like them. Talk about be- ripping your enamel right off your teeth. I don't understand how you're supposed to enjoy those. Are you, yeah, just, but are you just supposed to suck on them or No, what? what's great about them know. is that like one little box lasts a whole movie. That's but, what I used to like them because it just, you could like gnaw on one chewing for like, for like an hour. Yeah. 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 Did you guys ever get waxed lips when you were a kid? Yeah. yeah, yeah. What the that fuck? was a thing for a long time. What's the deal with that? I have no idea. It was like fun because it like made your face look all funny. So is that it? Because when yeah. I got it when I was a kid, I thought you were supposed to eat it. You do. Well, eat you it. you eat it eventually, but like well, why? Half the fun is just like it's like a candle. Being silly with your friends. It's nothing. It's, it's a, a candle. It's a flavored candle. It's yeah. disgusting. Yeah. It's straight petroleum in your chops. <laughs> You know what I mean? Is yeah, it that I bad? I don't get it. Yes. Look that up, Doug. It's what is, made out of fossil fuels. Were they, were they, <laughs> were they giving us plat? Were we fossil eating fucking plastic with sugar. as kids? Yeah. It's, that's what it is, dude. It's literally petroleum wax. It's wow. like eating Vaseline. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Hey, how'd you guys like Bill Burr? Oh, oh my dude. God. He, he's the master. He it was really good, huh? Is so, he, he was ripping people so yeah. hard. Then there was like a good segment where he was like making jokes about women, mm-hmm. and in front of us, because we're four rows back, we're like, I could. Oh, you saw some. Uh, I could throw my phone and hit him, right? Some cold responses. Oh, dude, there was like some millennials sitting in front of us, and it was like girls with their boyfriends. cement faces. That's and, what oh, and, the, and you could tell the guys were like, "Is it okay to laugh?" Every once in a while, they look at their girl and like, "I guess I can't." Their laugh. bodies like laughing, but not their, you know, they're not like like audibly laughing. No, see, look, wax lips are the common name of a candy product made of colored and flavored food grade paraffin wax. Yeah, cheap. Disgusting. There's such thing as food grade paraffin wax. I think what it means is it's wax that won't potentially kill you, so they call it food grade. <laughs> I see. You know what I'm saying? I see. No, but Bill Burr was fucking hilarious. Dude, He's got to be the best. He, I, I swear, he has like a, a roast Tourette's or something. Like he's so good at it. Like it's just it's automatic. Like when somebody yells something out, he just like focuses and lasers right in on them. Oh, you know? oh, and then I, I don't know what they had in that auditorium, but there must have been a show beforehand where confetti fell from the ground. Oh yeah. So every once in a while, confetti would kind of come down and eventually you think to yourself like he's ignoring it but then he starts addressing it then he goes he ad libs he just starts making jokes about the confetti and the crowd yeah that became part of the show he's so good well i think i think he was pissed i think that it was bothering the shit out of him because you could what you would see he'd be right in the middle of setting a joke up and 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 then one one or two pieces of confetti would come down and i would watch like all the people in front of us and to the side of us like look up to the left or right and You know, when you're part of being a good comedian is being able to draw you in and then smack a punchline on you. Sure, yeah, that mm. takes a little bit away from the punchline. Oh, for sure it does. Yeah. So you could tell that was bo- it was bothering him uh-huh. because it. Ha- but the, for him to roll with it like that was. I just smooth. I like yeah. him because I like it when comedians do a good job pushing boundaries, but do it in a way that it, that it's you know it's <clears> funny. Because it takes skill to do that, especially nowadays with everybody being offended by everything. Yeah. Um, which actually reminds me of a, a study. There was a, a study that came out that that really showed, and this is not the only study. There's uh, there's several now that have shown a strong correlation between intelligence and dark humor. So people who really like dark humor, there's a strong correlation between that and high intelligence. Now, I, what do you think that is? I think that if you have really dark humor, you have the ability to kind of see 
like both sides of it, right? That's yeah. what I think. That's what causes that. Is that right? What do you think? Yeah. I think I think people that like dark humor aren't necessarily sick people. They just see the irony. in Their the, mind goes into ridiculous places. Well, know? so here's what I think. I think because there's a there's a there's a novelty <clears throat> aspect to humor. So if something is funny, it's it's oftentimes because you don't expect it, or it's it's an unexpected punchline, or whatever. Yeah. And I think intelligent people uh, need to be challenged more in order for that to happen. So it has to be something that really, oh shit, I can't believe you just, yeah. and then you laugh. Because you, you, you train a lot of doctors, and I have some doctor yeah. friends too, that, and oh, they darkest. have the sickest humor, like like way beyond me. Oh, even. terrible. I was like, wow. And, and really smart people, you know, and the, but it, that's the thing. I think it's just, it also, I think it's like a, a, a filtration thing. Like they're expunging mm. these ideas out of their mind, you know, on some level. Oh, it's terrible. Well, what is that? What's the term when you can, when, when two, two opponents, Opposing ideas can live in your mind at the same time. What's that called? There's a term for that. Mm. You know what that is? Bisexual. No, it's not bisexual. Yeah, it can happen. That's what your friends call you. That's, yeah, not, yeah, what's yeah, just, yeah. that's not what I'm talking about. There's yeah. a term. You know, I can't, you don't know the term. You're worthless sometimes, yeah, no, I tell you. Come on. You're it, supposed it's, to not, it's not on command, bro. <laughs> <laughs> it just comes out. Doug, you don't have that? It's not in his wheelhouse. There is a term for that. When you when you have two opposing ideas that you that simultaneously you can you can hold hold, right? So what is that you can't you either it's the duality of ideas. The yeah. duality, I have no idea. Duality, for lack of a better term, we can use duality. Well, but I think that's works. what it is. I think it's the ability to see both extremes sure, of that. And sure. that m most people can't do that. Most people are easily swayed one way or the direction or yeah, manipulated. Where that. an intelligent person has mm -hmm. the ability to laugh at it because they don't see truly the be and the back. believe it. Yeah. They just think it's ironic. And, and, and they don't identify with the fact that they're laughing. Right. It so it's like, saying. I can laugh at this joke and it doesn't mean that I think that that's okay. It doesn't mean that I... I you know, promote that or whatever. I don't get offended or whatever. Yeah. Anyway, Vegas though, huh? Oh, God, yeah. does that, that, I don't know, about, this, this happens to me. I don't know if it happens to everybody. This is what happens to me. Anytime I fly into Vegas, I get in the, as soon as I get in the airport, you know when you when you smell a certain scent and it brings you back, you get memories. So like yeah. like you ever walk somewhere and you smell something, like, oh my God, this, oh, this reminds me of first yeah. grade or this reminds me of grandma's house. Okay. Yeah. You just soon as, smell debauchery. As soon as I land in Vegas, yeah. I'm like, oh, hungover. Oh, I'm gonna oh, feel like, <laughs> like, oh God, it's terrible. Yeah. Too much. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, that, yeah, you guys yeah, get that? Yeah, like, yeah. You just, just smell bad decisions. It's such coming a my way. It's such a place of like terrible. Gosh, everything. Yeah. Like you just everywhere. We're we're driving and cars are pulling up next to us. Taxis and the advertisements on are for either strip clubs or. Escort services or weed or right. guns. Yeah. You know, you can yeah. sh shoot machine it's like, guns. It's you know, like you with, landed with into Grand Theft Auto. You know? Yes. So you're just like, all right, cool. But uh, we, we did stay just in one place while we were there. That was the first time that I've done that, I think, where it was just like, here's the hotel. The event's right here. The meeting's right here. Yeah. You know, you're going to sleep right here. Uh -huh. Everything was like right there. Cosmo, Cosmo. Yeah. Nice, nice hotel. Yeah, I think that it was necessary for us to do it was an in and out trip for yeah. us you know what i'm saying yeah, it, was, it was convenient nothing nothing was worse than going to vegas that quick and then having to drive all over the strip to get to places yeah yeah, yeah. so uh, the fact that we were able to stay right in the cosmos now what's the longest you've ever stayed in vegas on the on the strip two days yeah that, there's no way i can stay longer I, I swear to god i don't think i could do it longer than two or three days i no. really don't after the second or third day i need to go home and take a shower you know what i mean <laughs> i need to like wash myself like i can't do this anymore yeah. how about you adam you've been uh, there for a week haven't you? yeah i have you've been a week haven't se you? seven days Jeez. yeah, yeah. Uh, wow but f it was not by uh not intentional so we one try one trip this is actually one of the first times that katrina and i really first first started talking uh, or started getting serious, I should say. Well, this is even before you were competing. Yeah, this is before I was competing. We went out there for a trip, and the this was God. I don't remember what time of the year it was, um, because we were flying to Florida after that. So I had like uh, ten days off of work, and we were flying first to party in Vegas for like four day, three or four days. No, only like three days. Three days, and then we were hopping on a plane and flying out to Florida, and then we had a place out in Florida for the rest of the trip. And I got this god awful flu, like so bad that I couldn't get up and. Oh, so you were just in Vegas because you were sick? Yeah, so it was in by uh, design. So what ended up happening was I had all the time off. I had to. I totally lost the money for the place that I had already paid in Florida. It was a timeshare situation that I had set hmm. up. So I lost the money on that. I had to cancel cancel my flight. Um, my buddy who was my buddies that were with me that were supposed to go up there and his wife, they flew back home, and I was like, I'm just gonna stay here. So I just mm. booked the rest of the week and oh, just Oh, well, that doesn't count. Yeah, yeah so you it was were stuck. Yeah, I was yeah. kind of stuck there. Now, what's the longest you've stayed there without 
being forced. Probably four days. Yeah, that's about that's max. Yeah, four days. I, and I like I like four days because I like a, a come in day that you don't really do much, and a, and a last day that you don't really do much, and then the partying is in between. See, I say that to myself every time. I say to myself like, we're gonna fly. Just take it easy tonight. Tomorrow night's the hard night. Let's just take <laughs> yeah, it easy. Yeah. Never happens. No, that doesn't. Yeah. It's hard. It's a from, great idea. But. Yeah, I did. I've done it where I flew in and partied and flew out and didn't even stay in a hotel. So we literally flew in, <laughs> landed at 8 p.m., went nuts, and then got on a plane at, I think it was like 11 a.m. the next day. Just, yeah. just no sleep. And Plans, just, no sleep. oh, and, and, and that's, that's the time, idea. that's the one, one of the only times I ever threw up on a plane. Oh, no, I've shared right stories where I've, I, I'm pretty sure I've shared on this podcast where we've done Vegas trips. Ve I mean, I was trying to think when I came in there, this, uh, for sure, Vegas is the most traveled to place for me, uh, at least 100 times that I've been to Vegas total in my life. And one of the times I remember uh, we were at, uh, what's the club that stays open all night long that's in uh, Barley, uh, uh, the, fuck, what's it called? I don't know. I'm losing, the, you know, <laughs> it's the Dre's. Okay. Yeah, sorry. The problem. Yeah, so it, uh, we go there all night long. And I think my flight is like at seven o'clock in the morning, seven or eight in the morning. And so instead of like trying to go home early and take a take a nap and then go, I was just like, I'm just gonna fucking party through the whole night and then I'll just take a cab at like six o'clock in the morning or whatever to the airport. And so that's what I did. And I remember I had I had checked in early, so I had like a priority, but I was so exhausted and I was so hungover from partying that I was afraid that I would miss the flight. So I I took my my duffel bag and the airport's almost dead at that time, and I put my little you know like a bag, like a pillow and in the Southwest a line at the very front. Cause I had like a five and fell asleep and like woke up to like people like stepping over me to get on the plane. And for them. That's like, that's like normal. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Nobody woke me up. It was great. You know what I'm saying? Like another day only in Vegas, everybody lets you get away with that. You know what I'm saying? There's like, Oh, no big deal. This, this guy had a hard one. Right. Uh, so yeah. disgusting. Be, <laughs> my favorite, my favorites to the hotel as the airport degenerates that are still gambling. You know what I'm saying? You can't get enough. Yeah, I yeah. got to spend more money. Well, you know, I think part we'll of that is- back. And so, those, you know those machines are the tightest. No, it's the opposite. In the airport? Yes, they hit the most. I read that they hit, they're the tightest. No, I, I think they hit, wrong. They hit the, the- I was just listening to a guy literally on- I, well, I've won in, a, in an airport. Right. Before. I was listening to a guy, okay, we were, before we flew back, uh, one of the dudes that works for the uh, um, Southwest- was talking to somebody who said the same exact thing, and he's like, "No, machine, whatever. I watched it hit for this much. This is about." Oh, and he might like, be just trying to sell it. He's full of shit. <laughs> well, why does he Southwest? Yeah. What the fuck does he care? Because he because he's he, he works for the the, the airline yeah, industrial complex. Maybe. <laughs> Stupid <dude. laughs> the airline industrial complex. Let me see. Yeah. I'm gonna look it up. Well, wouldn't it be like you'd want them to win so that way you're motivated to stay there, right? Like, oh yeah, awesome. Right. Let's keep this going. And then right. you go the, like get a hotel. Let me see. I don't uh, know. I don't know. I have to, I'd have to look it up. I'm trying to look it up right. Now to see I, which pure speculation. It'd be interesting how you would you would measure that statistically too, because obviously there's way more machines in a hotel than there is at the airport. So it's like okay, wait. airport slot machines are notorious for offering low payback. That's what it says, and I feel like it would be because well, maybe a lower payback, but more frequent. Maybe I don't know. Yeah, yes, yeah, so you win like a hundred bucks or something. Yeah, max. Or just now, like five thousand, like five thousand. That's enough to make you go fuck. I'm staying an extra an extra yeah. few days now. Eight percent difference between the, the the machines in the airports and the ones in the casinos, in terms of payback and uh, and frequency of wins. See, they're tighter, bro. Yeah. I knew that. No, I don't. See, think I, about it. Think about it. You're gambling in the airport. You're a degenerate. Your 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 plane is over there. You're like, you know what? <laughs> I lost ten grand, but I could win it back in the next forty minutes and see what happens. That's why yeah. I think I I right. think they do that. I think they do it to Justin's point because you got somebody who's like got to fly home and they're they're almost broke and so they they, they missed their plane. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they missed their plane. Yeah. They're like, might as well stay again and Dude. lose more money. Hey, Doug had a good time. Yeah, Ooh, did he have a good time? Hey, uh, only three. <laughs> Doug turned into Doug the Jug all over. Doug, oh, great. Doug went yeah. hard. Only three time. times in his life. <laughs> only three times in his life has he thrown up. I, that's what he said. Yeah, that's wow. what he said. So we're at I'm so glad to be a part of that. <laughs> you now. look good. So glad yeah. you're sharing this. Yeah. you look good, Doug. You look good though. <laughs> no, you look I, really I, healthy. I survived. Yeah, yeah. We, it was okay. You didn't so, do anything crazy, Doug. Well, I mean, so it was just. Yeah, I, I got to tell you tipsy. what my experience of the whole thing because you know you guys know how hard it is for me to not intervene and try and take care of people. Oh, make sure you don't have enough whatever. You guys always make fun of me, right? So I'm like, fine, I'm gonna let Doug do what he wants. So we're at Bill Burr. I wish you didn't. Yeah. yeah. See, yeah, yeah. Now you say that. Yeah, come on. Hey, every, every time hey, I jump in, everybody gets Doug needs, in front of me. Where Doug, were you, Sal? Doug needs you as a regulator, dude. No. Uh, no. Yeah. Well, so we're there, and and you know, Bill Burr, we already drank a bunch. Then we go watch Bill Burr. We had dinner. We're dying of laughter. We get up. Bill Burr's over. We're walking out, and Doug's like, wow, 
He goes, I'm fucked up, man. I'm really drunk. <laughs> That's what Doug is saying. So you know when someone says that. Yeah, yeah. Like, you know you're admitting smart. it. Yeah. So it then is. we go to the lounge, and he has two more drinks. <laughs> That's where you're supposed to say, Doug, yeah. hey, use your brain. I, I, start, from I started to, but you guys always make fun of me. So I'm like, hey, he's a grown man. Let's see. Let's no, he's a grown man. <laughs> you were slurring after the first one. Uh, hey, yeah. here's the thing. I hardly ever drink, yeah. and so I have no real uh, way to monitor mm-hmm. myself. I guess. Well, well I, you, I, I, you, he polished off a bottle of wine with my uncle at dinner. Yeah. yeah. Or so they or they put, polished off a bottle of wine there, and then that drink that we had a that was a triple shot. That dude poured uh, it heavy. Yeah. He was my hero of the well, night. Well, we asked for a double, the, and he the, like for sure it was yeah. like three and a half shots. He poured my whole cup up with Crown. I was like, thanks, guy. And then we go to the lounge, we're drinking more, and then I'm looking at Doug, and I'm like, you want me to take you upstairs, buddy? And he's like, yeah, I think you should. (laughs) So, (laughs) walked him upstairs, and you know, but your balance isn't bad. You've got really good balance when you've asked me. <laughs> Seriously, some wow. people can't walk. I thought I was going to have to carry him, but he did all right. He did okay. Yeah. And what, uh, did you throw up in the middle of the night or when you first went up? Uh, shortly after I got up there, yeah. Uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. And then you slept? Yeah, I slept good, actually. Uh, but, I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like, normally like a, you like wake like up I was really dead. early, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I slept till like 10 o'clock. Yeah. Yeah, we Sal wanted us to go bother. Interrupted. You know? Yeah, I told Sal, don't bother him. He's like, he's like, yeah. oh, I'm worried. I'm oh, so the next worried. morning. Yeah, yeah, he was hella worried. I was about gonna you. knock on your door at nine a.m. I'm like, don't do that. Okay. Let him. I said we have we have a later checkout. I said wait till wait till he's got at least until eleven before we go try and wake him up. Dude, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> it's a good time. Hey, by the way, uh, I think this is a good time to bring up how I was right again. So, anyways, have Dang. you guys seen? <laughs> I mean, I love these segments. Do you guys? Do you guys see Tesla's stock? How, Boom! How are you right on that? Yeah, why? Because you guys made fun of the the, the truck and said how ugly I'm it was. still going to make fun of it. That has nothing it. to do with the stock. No, it's a great yeah, company. No one said it was talking a, shit. No one said we're it was Tesla a, fans, bro. Yeah. You know, they, like that's where you're you're misinformed. They are. They're hitting. They're. I think. Right. As a matter of fact, as of as of this podcast, four hundred twenty-five. They are hitting astronomical didn't, numbers right didn't, now. Well, didn't the stock market just break more records again? It I did. Th- I but, saw a, a Trump tweet about that. Yeah, it did. It, oh, I know how funny, right? <laughs> yeah, how funny. But but Tesla, I mean, look what I'm doing. Tesla exploded, and you want to know what's crazy about Tesla? It's such a Tesla is such. A, it's, it, they trade it like a tech company. They don't really follow fundamentals like they do with other with other companies. Like they were at a loss at the beginning of the year. They showed them. They're showing like a uh, like that they may profit towards the end of the year. Blew mm-hmm. up the stock. Mm-hmm. It's crazy. China's opening a new factory too. Wow. But where were we just at? I heard them open up. I know they opened a big one out in Reno, didn't they? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. They and do it's have the, a big point the, there. the Model Y is supposed to begin production in uh, in 2020. Yeah. See here. Look at this. I have this article. Tesla's financial performance ranged from a more than 700 million dollar loss at the start of the year. <laughs> To crawling back into profitable territory in the third quarter, and yet their stock, their shares are sharing at like they're over four hundred dollars. Yeah, absolutely insane. So they got a lot of buzz from the truck, but let's be honest, it's still fucking ugly. <laughs> yeah. I bet you guys are going to see a lot of them. I well, of course. Know. I mean, there's there was a ton of Priuses well, everywhere. Our, I know. And our, I still stand by it. It's one of the ugliest cars I've ever seen. Yeah, yeah. it is. Our boy Brendan bought one, so I'll see it. Did he sure. order one? Yeah, he's already ordered one. Oh, that's How long yeah. until they would come in for people? If you bought, because when is, you said they they start. No, that's is that's no Model Y is different. That's not the Cybertruck, right? Model Y is that or did they call it? No, Model Y is a different car. Oh, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. I don't know. That's yeah, a, different a different car. car. When's the, when's the truck getting? I have made? no idea. Oh, I have no idea. All this talk about it, you don't even know. But huh? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, I'm just right. Yeah, yeah. so you know. Yeah, that's yeah, what yeah, I know. Yeah. I just want to like bring up them right and the you know stock prices and whatever. That's what and I know. Hey, that was it. you brought up the other day that I think Jessica watched "Don't Fuck with Cats" with me. We watched I, the first episode. Holy shit. Yeah, dude, that's not cool. I can't How did you watch the first one and not get pulled into I want to watch more, but here's what happened. We put it on and I convinced What made you even want to watch it? Cuz the only reason why I watched it was cuz I had heard I about watched it. the You know when you're on Netflix and if you hover over it, it'll show like a uh, like a commercial for it or whatever. Yeah. yeah. So you see some of it and I'm like, this looks really interesting. Yeah, that popped up on mine. I haven't watched it. So though. I told I so I convinced her, it's my bad. I, I convinced she likes this looks like it might bother me a little bit. I'm like, no, nah, it looks kind of <laughs> oh, cool. She straight called <laughs> yeah. that. I'm like it's, it's fine. very disturbing. And it's at night, right? Oh, right be before fine. bed. So I put it on on and we watched it and she couldn't sleep all night she had terrible nightmares all night freaked out felt like shit the next day she's like i am not watching anymore so i have to watch it on my own what? Yeah, yeah it's crazy it was terrible it's it, a terrible show you it, haven't it, seen it justin no so what it's like some psycho- i don't want to i don't want to like say anything so about it i don't want to say anything about it because it it uh i almost turned it off because it's so disturbing mm-hmm. like the first part of it i'm like oh, i can't watch oh, a whole damn. show on this 
But the, by the end of the first episode, it kept me in to go, okay, I'm just curious of what's going to happen in the yeah. second se- the second uh, episode. And then the second episode, it takes some like turns and twists. So essentially, and correct me if I'm wrong, Adam, because I haven't watched the rest See, of I don't it. Want to sh- you're, I, you haven't watched the rest, so you don't know. Okay, well, I'm not going to, this is what I'm going to say about it. And right. you let me know if I'm wrong. It seems like, so there's a guy that posts videos of himself doing terrible shit. And a bunch of people online band together, try and find out who this guy is and try to find him. So it feels like the rest of the series is about regular people figuring out how to find this guy through the internet and through that kind of stuff. Am I wrong? Yeah, a little bit. Wow, I am? Well, I mean, of course, they're involved in it the whole time. Okay. Yeah, because they're, they're, but this thing goes crazy. All, uh, worldwide, really? Yeah, no, this is a worldwide manhunt on this guy. Oh, dude! Yeah, wow. yeah, no, this is it's a it's a it's a big deal, and it's twisted, and it's got twists in it, and it's it's crazy. It's oh, a shit. it reminds me of a, a like a shorter version of uh, what was the one Justin and I brought up uh, to you? Making a murder. Yeah, making a oh, murder. Oh, really? Yeah, where mm-hmm. you're just kind of back and forth on which how you how you think about it or feel about it. So it, it doesn't. Yeah. It, it's a it's a crazy fucking doc. I can't believe I watched it. I didn't think I would. I was. Did would, Katrina watch it? No, she started it with uh, with me, and then she had a, she took the baby for a bath, and then she came down. She's like, "You're still watching that?" And I'm like, "Oh my god, it sucked me in. I can't stop watching." Uh, and so I pretty much finished watching it by myself, and uh, she was wrapping presents and doing stuff. So I should watch it. Yeah, yeah. All right. I watched yeah. that the confession killer. Did you watch any of that? Yeah, uh-uh. but yeah, it was all right. It was interesting. The guy was like. You don't know if he actually did kill some of the... I mean, he killed some of the people, but then he started claiming that he killed, like, all these people nationwide, like, all over the place, because, like, there's some racket there uh, with the marshals in Texas, the Texas marshals, and, like, they they treated him well, all this stuff, because then he was making their job a lot easier because he was just claiming that it was him that killed it, and so then it's like, okay, that case is solved now yeah you know did you uh, did i hear you talk about one time about the decrease in serial killers today and versus whatever yeah is, is it extremely low it's it's there was there it, it's a lot lower um <clears throat> than it, it, than it was in past decades a lot of that they think has to do with the fact that you know when you have crazy people who are like borderline but also who are narcissistic because a lot of these sociopaths uh, are also, you know, part of that that that, that psychology is that they're also extremely narcissistic. Right. Mm-hmm. So they're crazy. They're borderline, s- extremely narcissistic. And when they see people doing stuff and getting lots of attention, it sparks them to want to try to do the same thing. Right. A lot of serial killers like the chase. They like that people are talking about them. They're, it's not that they don't they they don't want to necessarily get caught, but they want to get resp- They want to know. They want people to know yeah. Yeah. that they're the ones that did it. Um, so it's this weird, and so with serial killers, same thing with like uh, people who do shootings. The more that happen, and the more that more publicity they get, the more tend to happen. Yeah. So if like if they stop getting publicity, the theory is that that we would actually see less of that kind of stuff. So are we, I always think about that, especially mm-hmm. when a tragedy happens. Like you, you wonder like how much better it would be if they like downplayed it. A they lot. would probably be better off. Uh, not reporting the killer's name and right. all his information and, oh, he was this and she was that or whatever. Just, you know, shooting happened. Don't talk about the person at all. Give them no no press whatsoever because that can actually trigger yeah. uh, people. Because there, there was a period there uh, in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, where there was a, it seemed like there was a fucking serial killer every other every other year. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there was a whole bunch. You know how they got some of them? I forgot who it was. I'm trying to think. They got one of them to kind of talk, admit to what he did. You know how they did it? They oh. preyed on his narcissism. Yeah. They brought him in. That's and they in said, that documentary, uh, Manhunter. Yeah. Oh, is it? Yeah. Uh, they, they, that's where they, they're like, they, hey, they if feed, you were to do it, yeah. how would you get away with it? Well, they, and they, 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 one of the guys that gets caught in there, and I, I think that it's based on true events. I don't know. It's a, I don't think it's a true story. I think it's based on true events. And they, they talk about that's like, was part of the, when they first figured out what serial killers were and they mm-hmm. were, because that wasn't even a thing before, what, the 70s or 60s? When did the first serial Well, killer? I mean, they've been around. Right, right, but we didn't have a title. We didn't have yeah. a name for it. You didn't it. have a psychological profile for it. Exactly, yeah. right? And so and one of the, when they figured out they were, they were highly narcissistic, they would, oh, wow, these guys want to talk about it. Mm-hmm. you know. Yeah. And so feeding into their ego and asking mm-hmm. was part of the way well, there they was entrapped the, them. There was the Zodiac killer who was in, I believe he was in San, California. San Francisco. San Francisco. Yeah, it's here. And he used to leave, he used to like tell police what he was going to do when he was going to do it he'd give him clues and what it's and like he'd like be there and watch yes yeah oh it's so creepy fuck oh, no. screw that anyway <laughs> so dude i was uh when when we were in vegas you know, you know i stayed there longer to, to visit with um jessica's family and her mom works at whole foods and you know we go over there to visit or wherever say hi while she's working 
and I hadn't eaten all day and I wanted protein. And, or, you know, Organifi doesn't sell retail, do they? No. Yeah, nowhere. So yeah, anyway. I have seen them. So I'm, I'm going, I get a vegan protein and it's, um, I can't remember the, the brand, uh, Life, I'm trying to think of the brand, uh, Organic Life or something like that. Uh-huh. Disgusting. I used to drink it all the time. Yeah. I used to drink it all the time yeah. and I forgot how, um, like, it tastes like powder dirt. You know what I mean? Well, that was the original thing that made me because I I tried I tried I, 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 vegan protein like I don't know ten years ago, uh, just to see because I had heard people tell me like you know you your stomach could be upset or could be bothering you because you have a lot of weight. Yes. And so I tried it and I was like, oh, yeah. it just it tastes so different. And if you're used to like whey protein shakes and then you make the switch over to a vegan a vegan protein, it's really tough. Raw to- protein, that's what it was called. And it was so disgusting. It was like a it was like a cho- and I used to drink it all the cuz I can't have dairy. I used to drink it all the time. But I haven't had anything like that in a long time because of Organifi, that's the one that I'll that I'll use now. Yeah. So whatever, I mean, it's crazy when you do a different one. And you realize how good how good they they did as far. Yeah, you as, forget it's vegan protein. Yeah. It's, the it's the so texture sweet, and the yeah. flavor for I mean, it's about as good as it gets. You know. That's yeah. right. That's yeah. right. Absolutely. Yeah. Hey, I was reading another um, article um, that I wanted to bring up. So uh, there's this huge migration that they're observing right now of millennials and younger, but mainly the the, the statistics are coming out millennials who are leaving religion. Uh, on on mass, just yeah, just by the droves, they're le- leaving religion. And in the past, when this has been observed, they the what we've seen is that people leave religion as kids, but then when they start families, they go back to religion. Yeah, not happening this time. Hmm. Millennials now are getting married, and they're not going back to religion. So this is the largest migration of that we've seen of a population leaving. Uh, now, is there something they attribute it to? Um, well, I have a few points here that they talk about in the article. They said that, you know, one, one thing, many millennials didn't have strong time ties to religion to begin with. Mm -hmm. So they're less likely to develop those habits or associations that made it, make it easier to return to religious community. So a big part of it's their parents. Their parents didn't raise them in that. Um, and that makes a big difference. Um, they're also increasingly likely to have a spouse who is also non-religious, so then they marry someone who's also, uh, you know, not in, in the religious practices or whatever. Um, and then there's changing views about relationship about the relationship between morality and religion. And so a lot of people, young people, are convinced that religious institutions are irrelevant or unnecessary for their children. What do you guys think of that? Do you guys think that that is good, bad? What are the potential side effects of that? What do you guys think? Yeah, I think I think it'll swing. Like it always does, you mm-hmm. know. I think that it was inevitable we would go this way, and and I think that uh, I think we'll you'll see see a, a big movement out, you know, of people, and then you see people like the bishop barons that are starting to reach and and penetrate social media at and the masses like mm-hmm. he is. That's kind of bringing people more back that direction. So I think it'll 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 naturally swing. At the end of the day, like the the thing that because. Uh, Katrina is, uh, you know, Katrina's spiritual. She's not religious, mm. right? So she comes from a family that that talks about spirituality a lot. Um, I come from a family that talks about Christianity and God, right? So uh, we're not the same when it comes to that. But at the end of the day, the, the values and principles um, that I learned co- going through like church and being a Christian growing up, um, she 100% values that. And like there wouldn't even be a discussion. Like if I wanted to bring Max to church, she would be 100% supportive of it. In fact, she would encourage it uh, because we see the value in uh, just well, there's the, a, there's the structure a, there's of it. There's a lot of spiritual truth that you find in different religions. They're all different, different practices, but they all kind of echo similar things. So I guess you could call that spiritual truth or wisdom. But when you dive deeper into these studies, you find that although millennials are leaving religion, it doesn't mean that they're not spiritual. Yeah, right. they're well, chasing the crystal. Th- that thing. What I would argue yeah. is is a lot of the resurgence of what you kind of saw, like in the '60s, and you know, like where people are kind of going to these festivals. They're they're looking for connection in different ways, like community mm-hmm. in different ways. I think it's like uh, the the need is still there. They don't realize like how to fill that need mm-hmm. yet. And I think that it's just you know th- this is a period where like if they weren't exposed to it and and we we went away from it for a while, it seems like. Like the necessity isn't there, yeah. where I, you know it's gonna it's I, come to a halt. I also think that like things like Christianity be under have been under attack quite a bit. Oh, last, it's not cool. The last few decades, yeah. yeah. So I mean, an example 
we were uh, we were just reading something, right? Like I think we brought up on this show maybe a, a month or two ago. One of us, I don't know who saw it, said it first, was talking about uh, Joel Olstein and his mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. you know bajillion dollar property or whatever like that. And then just recently, we were talking to him and found out that he doesn't take any money from the church yeah, at all. Not it from Which, the by the way, most he sells books and yeah, shows. most pastors do that. Most pastors take a salary from that's their job. Yeah, right. Uh-huh. So part of part of the, the them takes a salary so they can their yeah, that's can, commendable at that point. Yeah, right. So, so you know, and but yet we there's so many memes made around his massive house and how wealthy he is mm-hmm. and this and that. And it's like, well, I mean, if this guy built this church and community and he, and he completely puts all that money back either to helping other people or back into his community and then takes zero dollars for himself. And we're going to shame him because he writes a book and millions of people buy it. Mm-hmm. Like, right. That's kind of weird to me. You know what I'm saying? And it's, it's kind of unfair. And even myself was unaware of that. Like, yeah, I, don't, I totally I'm not like was a, judgmental on that until I heard that. Right, like, right. Oh, I'm not, okay. a, I'm not pro or yeah. I'm not pro or yeah, I don't anti. know a whole lot about right, it. Right. I don't either, but yeah. it's, uh, that's an example of what, uh, things like that. I think get put out there into social and, and somebody sees it real quick, doesn't know much about it, and like, oh, just another thing that confirms that church people are bad. Well, they're I, out, they're out for money, and they're there, they're out there. Well, because you know. you've seen televangelists out there that have really, you know, been called out and done some shady things. You know, like that's happened in the past, going through the '80s, and like, you know, you saw these examples oh. of people just taking money. If, there, if there's a way to influence people and take advantage of them, bad people are going to find a way right. to, to use that, and that doesn't matter. If, I don't, it's a position of power. I don't care if it's supplements, the fitness space, religion, politics. Right. Uh, if there's a way to influence people and then take advantage of them and be a shitty person, you're going to find shitty people in that space. Not all of them, but you're going to find them, be attracted there and be like, oh, this is a great way to manipulate the hell out of people. Sure. Um, you know, when it comes to beliefs and stuff like that, you know, Carl Jung warned about this and said essentially that, you know, people were, they, we always will worship something. And he feared that the, that the, you know, removing God um, in his words um, people would replace it with government. Um, and mm. what we saw in the 20th, 20th century was a, a lot of that with communism and Nazism and fascism is that people, when they stop worshiping things, uh, or they think they stop worshiping things, they, they actually replace it with something else. And oftentimes it's... Well, I found that really interesting that even somebody who considers himself an atheist, like Mark Manson, was talking about uh, the hierarchy of that, like that it's you worship something. Mm-hmm. You know, so if it's not a god, it's something else. You mm-hmm. know, whether you think it's it usually or not. it'll it'll be a material thing if it's not God, typically. Right. So if it's not something metaphysical, then it's probably something material. And there's, I mean, I don't know. You can make the argument good and bad about that, but uh, to say I don't worship anything is false. You, you do worship something. It's just your top, you know, your top value. Your well, top it, it could it, it could be good for a lot of people that that's their their main driver and passion for many years until what ends up happening is that, and, and I think that's the case that like someone like Bishop Barron tries to make is that mm-hmm. uh, eventually that leads to, to yeah, money. What was it? Money, power, honor, pleasure, yeah. a mm-hmm. few other things. No, it's really interesting. It, you 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 made a good point about how um, especially Christianity gets made fun of in, in the West. I think it's because they allow it. You know, it's one of the only religions that if you make fun of, they kind of sit back and don't say yeah. a lot. And they've also, obviously, they're extremely influential, so they're like the big guy, right? The big guy that you can poke. Well, poke just fun be at. just be consistent. And, you know, make fun of all of it across the board. You that, know, that's like, like if you're going to do it. Yeah, I, it, but you know, it, it reminds me of something I was thinking about over the weekend. Is how you know how, how fathers are depicted, how fathers have been depicted in modern media for so long. I think it's it's sending the message to men that being a dad, uh, you know, having kids and whatever sucks. That's shitty. It's not cool. You know, if you look at movies and TV with dads, they're like idiots and they think about the days when they weren't, you know, married and they could do whatever they want. And I think yeah. a lot of guys How they can hang out at the bar longer just it, to not go home. Yeah. Yes, and the and you know what's funny is that for most of human history, it was never that way. For most of human history, a man's pres- sense of pride. It was prestige and pride to have yeah. a lot of children. I have four sons. Exactly. Yeah. Or, you know, I have five, you know, ten children, I have fifteen grandchildren. I you know, I'm married for whatever and People were like, "Wow, what a great!" It's not like that anymore. Like, like media has depicted it as like, "Oh, you're married. Oh man, that sucks." Or, "Oh, you've got kids. Oh, poor you. You can't go have fun." And again, well, I, even being a mother too. I mean, that's yes. been been a lot of shame in that direction, which is bizarre to me. It's weird, right? I feel like we need to reverse it a little bit and and, and tell people the like the, the yeah, it is hard, but it's also uh, 
extremely meaningful. I think it's something to strive for. Well, it's more than just – it's hands down the most important. I, I also think, too, like the real MVPs, man, are fucking single parents. Yeah. Oh, that's you know, so hard. All, I can't all, imagine that. All you have to do is be a, a dad or a mom and, and, and fucking spend one day with your, your newborn for a weekend, yeah. and like you have this whole new appreciation for the people out there that oh, are – It's tr- the job you never clock out of. Yeah. No. It's just always there. No. I, I mean, if if – I can't imagine if I didn't have Katrina and I had to raise Max and, and I believe that we've built something very conducive to like making that happen. Like if I had like, if that happened and I had to raise Max by myself and the work environment that we have, like I would bring him here and there'd be ways around that. And even that. And you have a successful business. Right, right. Imagine if you were- Just a normal person. Normal person. You're making normal money. Work at nine to five. Nine to five. You have to raise a kid by yourself. Oh my gosh. uh, the, The challenge that that would present- which is why oftentimes they're in poverty. Oftentimes, yeah. if you're a single parent, you're you're in poverty. So, but I do think society needs to because societal pressures aren't all bad. I know all the time. Well, you could make the case too that we needed to swing that way too a little bit because then there was then there's that other thing too where I think a lot of people were having kids early and irresponsibly and and mm-hmm. not and not stepping up to the plate. You know, uh-huh. twenty years old popping a kid out and you still want to go clubbing every night and you're leaving your kid home. So but you're different. See, that's the thing. That's what I mean. Societal pressure. Sometimes we talk about like society expects us to be this way. So and that's stupid or whatever. I get that, but there's just, there's also a certain there's a certain there's a reason why certain societal pressures exist, and it's because we're social creatures, and sometimes societal pressures exist because they help us be better. Yeah. Um, and one of them is you know uh, you know the societal pressure of you know be be there, be a good per- parent. Men don't have the same pressure as women do, which is why I think part of the reason why I, th- I think a lot of men uh, leave their kids. Yeah. Because it may, you know what, if a mom leaves her kid, the kind of the, the looks that she'll get and the way people will talk to her, yeah. then you got dads who are like, "Oh, I'm there every other weekend," and like, "Oh, you're a great dad," yeah. you know, "Good job." No, man. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you got to be there. You know, yeah, you got to yeah. be there for your kids, just like the just the, just like the mom is or whatever. I think that's super important. Yeah, I agree. Did you guys watch any uh, Christmas movies over the holidays? Did you guys watch anything yet? Yeah, I watched a few. You have? Yeah. What you, what, what are your go to? Well, you- the the main one that the whole family loves, Elf. You know, that's that's our first go to. Uh, we watched. What's that other the, the really old one like it's it's a wonderful life or something like that is that oh, the one I never yeah. saw that yeah yeah that's the one like I I grew up watching that movie and then obviously the Christmas story up oh, you know my favorite actually is National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation mm. or, oh I haven't watched that one in a long time yeah that one's my favorite because it's just like you know it's like hilarious and uh, I mean there's some language in it so I'm always like trying to like earmuff the kids but uh, Rusty. It's, it's worth it yeah, yeah. I love yeah. I love my Wait, fa- my favorite Christmas movie is Die Hard did you. There is, oh, there is no better is, Christmas. Yeah. Movie. Did you did you watch any? You and you and Reddit. Uh, you love, know, all the internet trolls. Yeah. No, I I watched um bah, humbug. I watched a new one on Netflix called Noel, which was actually pretty good. It was a cute movie. Yeah. Oh, Katrina uh, yeah. turned it off. She thought it was cheesy. Did as she? Fuck. Yeah. It, it is a little cheesy. <laughs> it <laughs> is. Yeah, but it, it off, most Christmas movies are a little cheesy. Yeah, yeah. How about you? Uh Elf. Uh that was uh Elf and then Arthur's Christmas. Have you seen that one before? No, what's no. that? That's like a uh, you know cartoon, cartoon digital animation type one. That's actually pretty funny. Really? Yeah, yeah. It's actually good. Nah. It's like uh, Santa has like two sons, and he's got like then one of them's like the Arthur, who's like this kind of weak little weakling yeah. son, and he has like the real Christmas spirit and wants to be like the the next coming Santa when Dad passes on. Mm-hmm. And then there's like the kind of like asshole brother who's like all big and like like you know <laughs> yeah and like wanting the power and stuff, and so the struggle of the two of them like fighting to be the next Santa. It's actually a cool. It's a cool story, and it's like kind of futuristic. It's cool. It's great. I like. It's one of the ones I really like. That one, and then we watch uh, uh, the Christmas Carol with uh, Jim Carrey, the, uh, the yeah. animated version. Of that that's a definite. So that one and Elf are like traditional too that we always watch because one Elf is my favorite. I think it's uh, just, Elf wins. Yeah, it's yeah. just so fucking funny. Did you guys one. watch? Um, have you guys ever seen Polar Express? Yeah. Oh yeah, with Tom yeah. Hanks. Creepy, right? And it's a little weird. It is a little weird. The animation's a little, they're a little. Yeah, it makes it kind of a little bit off. Yeah, mm-hmm, it's, mm-hmm. it's kind of a strange thing. Yeah, yeah. That's like the Christmas Carol has that weird animation like that where Does it's it? like they use, you can tell the the cartoon is Jim Carrey's face, but it's a little distorted or whatever. It looks, that's kind of like how they did it with Polar Express. Mm-hmm. Beowulf was like that. You guys ever watched that? Uh, yeah. Yeah, Beowulf was pretty. Mm-hmm. Was that, what was that nude scene with, uh, was it Angelina Jolie playing that one character? <laughs> I was like, dang. <laughs> that was a nice transition. Yeah, there. I like that. <laughs> See, we're all yeah, talking about Christmas family. Like, yeah, I'm thinking about this naked cartoon <laughs> character. <laughs> you know, I got one for you, though. There was, uh, this is so random, but 
every Christmas, like my brother and I, we have to watch this. Like at my parents' house, uh, it, it's the uh, the raisins Christmas. So they did like a special, the California raisins. This oh is like way gosh. beyond, yeah, like anybody. Oh my god, listening I remember that. Remember. One of the most successful ad campaigns of all time. Yeah. So like they actually did this whole like special, and it's all claymation and everything, and so it's like super like cheesy, but like awesome cheesy, you yeah. know. And like they're all singing, and uh, th- there's lots lots of little skits in it and everything. But it's like I have to watch it on VHS. And my mom <laughs> you guys have literally, a VCR? Yeah, we, we have one VCR, like literally just for that. Like every oh, year. I can't believe you guys have a VCR. Yeah. Dude. It's crazy if you have a DVD player these days. I know. That's crazy. That's crazy. <laughs> yeah, it's still where it's getting like every year it gets worse too. Like like the it starts getting choppier and a little fuzzier, you know. I'm like, oh no, I wonder how long this is gonna last. It gives it that good quality though, doesn't uh, it? Oh yeah. <laughs> First question is from Coach Carruthers. Would it be beneficial to train purely unilateral for a phase or two to combat imbalances and increase overall strength? Yes. Yeah. Love Great it. approach. A hundred percent. I I am right now in the middle of my longest cycle of doing that for my lower body. So I I love squatting, love deadlifting. I did them for years, got pretty good at both of them, especially the deadlift. And I started noticing that I just I had an imbalance between the two sides and it became glaring when I would do weighted uh, Bulgarian split stand squats squats or lunges. Mm-hmm. And it, it was glaring in the sense that it just felt different. Like my left foot, when that was forward, felt different than when, when my right foot was forward. So I said to myself, I'm not going to squat at all until I feel super strong with uh, lunges and Bulgarian uh, split stand squats. And so I'm probably three or four months into just doing that. And I'll tell you what, the, the leg development <sighs> is good. But what's better is my stability. Mm -hmm. I feel so much more balanced. And I know when I go back to squatting, I'm going to feel that much stronger because of it. Oh, absolutely. It's going to make you stronger. I I know it's the same thing. uh, And it it happens so gradually. Mm -hmm. You know, like my my hips started to just barely rotate, like ever so, you know, little, little by little. It it became an exaggerated thing to where then, you know, in the middle of the night, like I would get pains and things shooting down my leg and, and, you know, to it, now I've learned to address it a little bit earlier and start, you know, doing more unilateral training because it does, it, it provides so much more stability around my hips. So that way, when I'm doing these bilateral movements, everything's like working together simultaneously. You are able to produce more force to be, it makes you stronger. So I was making a case for this a couple of years ago on here when we were talking about Bulgarian split squats and what a game changer it was for me and my squat. It was when I was going through the whole mobility stuff, I did the same thing as Sal was, I, I kind of stopped uh, squatting with both feet and started doing split, split squats. And it was a it was a game changer for me. And I think this is true even if you don't have a discrepancy and imbalances, right? So if you even if you have uh, you know good symmetry and you're not off, I still think there's a lot of value in unilateral training. Period, right? So doing one leg, one arm uh, at a time. So I think everybody should face at least uh, at least annually, if not you know every every couple months, throw in some training uh, training blocks that are primarily unilateral. So. I find value in that for anybody, even if you're not. And if for sure, if you have imbalances going on, I think there's a ton of value. Yeah, and you, you're, you're. I think people will fear that they're going to lose muscle no, and lose strength. Not at all. No, and you know, there's this, there's this phenomenon that happens with resistance training that um, I identified a long time ago, and every once in a while, I take advantage of it. And that's when you do a new exercise, you're not nearly as strong as you are when you do exercises you're very familiar to. Now, why is this a good thing? Because the potential for progress is massive. Like when I do, a, a, you know, when I'm doing squats with 315 and I feel comfortable doing that and I haven't done lunges in forever and then I get underneath a 105 pound barbell and do lunges, my legs are getting real fatigued because it's a new skill. That means as I'm learning, as my body's getting used to it, my progress from, and that lunge is going to go from 105 to 225 in a relatively short period of time, I'm not going to get that with my squat because mm-hmm. I've, I'm, I've, I'm kind of tapping the ceiling with my squat, so to speak, or at least I'm closer to it. So that potential for growth is there. And what ends up happening when you add 50, 60 pounds to an exercise as you get better at it is you just – your body responds. You get exceptional uh, results. Now, one of the best ways to apply this, by the way, and this is something that you know Adam communicated a long time ago I thought was brilliant – is make sure you start with your weaker side and use that, let that dictate 
how much weight and reps you do throughout the workout. Uh, because what you don't want to do is you don't want to start with your strong side and then maintain the discrepancy between the two. So let's I'll give you an example. Let's say I'm doing uh, let's say I'm doing a Bulgarian split stance squat, and I notice my left leg is much weaker, and I can hold 30 pound dumbbells and only do eight reps with my left leg, but with my right leg I can do 12 reps. I'm only going to do eight. I'm going to stick to what my weaker side can do and allow that to catch up. I'm not going to do eight on my left and 12 on my right, and just keep have them both grow, but continue to maintain the you know the discrepancy between the two. Allow the weaker side to to dictate the weight and the reps, and then watch what happens. And start with the weak side. Start with it in the beginning of your workout. You know, studies show that how you prioritize your exercises. You know, the exercise you do first in your workout tend to get the most gains. Start with the weak side and allow that to happen, and watch what happens. And, you, and now, visually, what does this look like? Visually, you start to develop more balance in your body. Your pecs match better. Your lats start to look like they match better. Your shoulders, your your legs. Then when you go back to your uh, your compound movements, we're using a barbell and two arms and two legs. All of a sudden, like when you jump back, you just feel solid. Yeah, you yeah. feel way more solid and way more stable. Um, and then that allows you because here's the other thing you want to consider. Oftentimes, what's holding you back from progressing is the weakest link in whatever it is in your body. Right. Your body will not allow you to progress past the weakest point. So if the discrepancy between, for example, your right and left leg is big, that may be what's keeping your squat at whatever weight. Well, and I think, too, like that's the problem is, is you're thinking about how much weight you're actually moving. And, and people get get fixated on that but they don't realize this you're getting novelty gains you're getting these gains that are actually like you know, building more support so that way when you go back to these other lifts that you're doing it, it's going to feel more secure more stable like you're going to be able to allow your your body's going to be able to allow to to, to produce more force to, to get stronger so it's a lot of times it's the missing piece to to getting past your your plateau oh totally uh single leg deadlifts another phenomenal exercise it's an exercise that if you're stuck with your deadlifts, I tell you what, if your numbers on your deadlifts are stuck, try doing single leg deadlifts for, you know, I don't know, three, four weeks. Go back to your traditional deadlift That's and watch gnarly. what happens. Yep. Next question is from Matt Ammo. How reliable is it to judge progress based on soreness? Is it possible to be sore and not be making progress in terms of building muscle? Uh, I love this question, oh, man, because this is, I think, more people... We haven't addressed this in a while. And, and I think more people than not um, make this mistake. I made this mistake forever. I mean, uh, chasing the soreness and thinking that, you know, how sore I was... Uh, dictated how successful of the workout yeah, was. Yeah, the more and, sore, the better. Right, and and honestly, uh, this heads you down actually a, a, a really bad path uh, to building muscle. What ends up happening is you end up, uh, are, your body's constantly trying to recover from all the damage you've done that you actually don't allow it to ad adapt and progress. And this was a really hard thing for me, especially when I started to go from the training a muscle group one one time a week, right? Was, you know, and when when I when all the stuff started coming out on frequency and frequency, frequency was uh, was king in that it was you know far superior than uh, the intensity in one workout. If I could hit that muscle three times in the week versus one time really hard, I would see change. The problem was when I first made that transition, I still had that train that hard mentality, and I took it into the two and three times a week, and I'm like, I'm not going anywhere. I'm not progressing. I'm getting weaker, if anything, but that was because I was hammering my body, and I wasn't backing off the intensity. And technically, when we're really sore like that, it's actually technically a sign of overtraining. Mm -hmm. People don't, if, if you read the literature on that, it's you've you've trained the body so hard that you've, you've gotten really sore. So the idea of chasing really, being really sore in order to try and build muscle is completely false. And some of the best gains that I started to get was when I backed off of chasing that, I was able to get three workout, three workouts a week on legs, which I wasn't able to do when I was training that in high intensity mm -hmm. chasing soreness. I, I looked at it more like practice and perfecting the squats and the deadlifts and the movements, not worrying about going to failure. And that's when I started to see my body really progress. But that took me years to get out of this mentality. Oh, same here. So there's two myths around soreness. One is that really, really, when you get really sore, it means you had a good workout. And then the other one is that you should never train a sore muscle. Those are both uh, two myths. So let's start with the first one. 
Soreness indicates potential that there was maybe some damage. If you're really, really super sore, you probably overdid it. Uh, my best progress in, in, in my workouts and my clients was often when they didn't get sore. It was often when we would work out and the next day they'd say, oh, I feel a little bit, but I'm not really sore. That was usually the right. So that's when I would use soreness. The way I would use soreness would be if, if they were really sore, I know I did too much. Other than that, I, I, it didn't really make a big difference. Right. Now, the other myth is that you don't train a sore muscle. And I used to fall prey to this when I was a kid where, oh, it's chest day, but my chest is still sore. That means it's still recovering, so I can't work it out. Actually, you'll recover faster. if you Now, if you have to work it out with a low intensity, you're not going to go to the gym and beat the crap out of yourself again. But if you're sore, sometimes the best thing you could do is stretch the muscle and exercise it. Work it out a little bit. And you'll find that the soreness will actually dissipate within the workout. Like right then and there, you'll start to feel the soreness go away. And then you'll start to recover faster. Yeah, as long as the intensity is appropriate. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Intensity has to be appropriate, though. So that way it's restorative. Yeah, I think, and this is a tough one, especially when you're first starting out, because like uh, all this novel stimulus, all this new stuff that you're trying to learn, like your body is going to react to it inevitably. And so uh, finding that right amount, that right dosage of stress uh, each, within each workout uh, really does. Like it takes practice. And so, um, you, you know, as I've gotten older, like I've definitely tried to, to voice like less is more. And like that used to never be my message. It was mm. always like, ah, oh, you, you know, you get over it, you'll get through it. And <laughs> like, it's really not that advantageous for you to blast yourself like right out of the gates, like you would think. So, uh, you know, be mindful of that like there's going to be soreness involved, but you know, reducing that and, and trying to find the right dose of uh, exercises and to build upon is much more effective strategy. I, I, I like what you said, Sal, about like the way you use soreness, because that's how I use it now like I still use it as a gauge but it's more so to tell me I overdid it right yeah. it's not like I'm like I was a as a uh -huh. young kid lifting I used to chase the soreness and it used to be like you know if I wasn't like crippling sore it was like oh I didn't get a hard enough I didn't enough. do enough I didn't do enough where it's I have kind of the opposite uh, idea now it's like oh, okay if I feel really sore, or if, even if I just feel pretty sore, I'm like, ah, I overreached more than mm -hmm. I need to. I want to feel like I just, I could tell I worked out. Like That's the, it. the next two days, I want to feel like, oh yeah, I could, if I flex that muscle, I can feel like mm -hmm. the, it's been worked and it's a little sore. But if I'm limping, you know, or someone pokes me in the chest and I'm like, oh, you know, if I'm sore to the touch, that's way overdoing it. Right. I did not need, I didn't need to, uh, to stretch that far, that far to get the muscle building benefits of not only the breaking down process, but also the adaptation process. So, and it's, it's a very, that, that's a sweet spot. That's what you're trying to do. You're trying to stretch your, your capabilities just enough that the body is forced to adapt a little bit. And maybe there's a little bit of damage done that you have to repair, recover, grow, and strengthen. But what you don't want to do is overreach so much that it's one, going to hinder the next workout. And two, your body is taking most of the nutrition into prior towards just recovery. And it's actually impeding on your, your, your workouts in the next couple yes, of days. Healing and adaptation, uh, for the sake of this uh, argument are two separate things. Okay. Now they do oftentimes happen at the same time, but healing does not mean ad adapting. So just because you're sore and your body heals, it doesn't mean it's going to go then and get stronger. And in fact, if, if you're listening right now, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You're, you're, if you're plateaued and you're getting sore every single workout and you're, and you're not sore and then you work out and then you're sore and then you, then you rest and then you're not sore and you work out and yet you're in the gym and you're not stronger, your body's not changing, muscles aren't building, all you're doing is healing and all you're doing is creating damage and healing. Damage and healing. You're not allowing your body to adapt. Adapting is on top of the healing process or again, for the sake of this podcast, you can consider it as something separate. And getting too sore, creating too much damage, all that does is makes your body need to heal. It doesn't even think about adapting. It doesn't have time. doesn't have resources to do so. It's just going to heal. That's great. There's nothing wrong with that. But if you're trying to progress, um, then you're just spinning your tires in the dirt. Next question is from Philly Fan 1728 I see the West Side Barbell guys doing heavy box squats. Is there a benefit to this compared to traditional squats? If so, what and why would you incorporate it into a program? I love box squats. Box yeah. squats, uh, box squats were one of the one of the ways I got my squat up to the, the the only time, the first time I ever did, and the only times I did I did over four hundred pound squat. It was the box squat that took me 
to the next level. Mm -hmm. Now, what I what I take from the box squat, so to do a, a proper box squat, by the way, is you get under bar, like you're going to do a squat, you take a low box. Actually, you can use different different heights, but I would pick a box that would have me at the bottom of my normal right, squat. Your end range squat. My end range. And I would slowly lower myself down. I'd sit, and I'd stay tight. I wouldn't bounce off the squat. I've seen mm -hmm. people do this on a box where they, yeah, they or, use it as, a, as like a tap or whatever. Or they rock back. Or they rock yeah. back. I would sit down on the box, stay tight. I'd wait about two seconds, and then I'd stand up. And what I took from that was my the strength at the bottom of my squat got so much better. Oh, yeah. It made me way stronger at the weakest part of my squat. And I think it's because when you're at the bottom and you sit there for you're a second. You're at a dead stop. You're at a dead stop, yeah. you're and you're, you're, you're getting rid of a little bit of that, uh, that, that elastic rebound that you get from – the bottom of an exercise. So would, you have to lift from almost a dead, you know, position. I would make the argument that uh, it's similar benefits as pause squats. Mm. Uh, it, you know, it's you're taking momentum out, right? Yeah. That's and, and I think that with 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 squatting and and less so with deadlifting, but with squatting, especially, you get that major rebound effect of bouncing off the back of your calves and the 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 release and they pop back up. Whereas if you stop and you pause for two or three seconds and then come back up, I mean that's very similar to the, the the box squat feel where you're sitting you're completely stopped and they come out you know you uh, you could also you instead of using the box too you could also use like a the the rack and come to the bottom of, of the until the weights hit the rack and then you're at the bottom and then come from a dead a dead yeah. stop like you that. can but the box is a little different because when you sit on it even though you're staying tight in your core your muscles do relax far more than if you're supporting it at all right right and so you kind of sit down pause for a second come up and the, the, the carryover, the reason why the guys from the West Side Barbell did it was because of the carryover. Mm -hmm. when, you, when you got stuck in your regular squats, you start doing some box squats, all of a sudden your regular squats start to go through. Now, the yeah, you're training the recruitment process. You're enhancing that pro in, in the most vulnerable part of the exercise, right? The one where you're down at the bottom of your squat. Typically, you're not going to produce the most, fo the most force in that position. And so to then, you know fixate on that part of the exercise where you know typically you don't have that much force production now let's let's train that to to really like hone in and focus on generating more force with that it's going to benefit you tremendously mm -hmm. now we're making the case for how how great they can be i'm going to make the case for the other side too that it's it's not the most valuable thing for the average person uh, I think more people would benefit from working on their their squat depth and getting better range of motion than loading the bar heavier and shortening the range of motion up and going heavy. As far as the carryover it has for strength and building a squat up, incredible. So I think it's an incredible tool like many other tools, and that's the reason why Westside Barbell uses it and does it. But for the average client, um, I, I, I had more people that – were stuck at not being able to get a squat to 90 or beyond 90. And so putting a box underneath them where they don't even hit 90 degrees or barely do hit 90 degrees. Um, I, and loading, and normally what people do with box squats too is they load it heavy, really heavy. I don't see a lot of value in that for the average person. I use box squats more for the average person to actually treat, to teach form. Yes. I was just going to say, I was going to give you some pushback because I loved box squats for the average person. For, for, for form, really, yes. like to teach them how to sit. Like it was a great way to teach someone how to sit back. Like if you get a yes. client, the, and trainers will understand this that are listening, um, you know, sometimes uh, cueing, hinging at the hips is like, what the fuck does that mean to mm -hmm. Susie who's, you know, 65 and is never fucking, mm -hmm. doesn't know what that means, right? But telling them, sit back on the box. And because the box will catch them, right. they're not afraid to sit Exa back. Exactly. So they, they get more comfortable with the, the movement pattern of sliding the hips back and sitting down into a seat or a chair. So that's how I used a box right there, which is not how Westside Barbell. Westside Barbell is using it for the, the what we talked about at the right. beginning, which is building strength, tons of value for it. I think it's amazing for those reasons. But when, when, I, when I think back to the average person that I train, which is I think the majority of people probably listening to this podcast, I'm not really using box squats that often unless it's somebody who's like really new. I'm teaching mm -hmm. how to hinge back. But if it's like the average person who's been weightlifting for a couple of years, it's just not a tool that I use that often. It's for so the first time when I started doing box squats with other people, it was this is when I started to understand priming. This is box squats actually are what led me to really start to understand the the difference between priming and warming up because I noticed 
when I'd have my regular clients do box squats before they squatted, their squats look better. Mm -hmm. And it was because exactly what you're saying. It taught them, it got them in the right recruitment pattern and feel. In fact, MAPS Anabolic box squats are put in there before traditional squats specifically for that reason. This is before, you yeah. know, ever ever talked about or created a program like MAPS Prime. Well, and I too, I think that it teaches uh, supportive muscular tension uh, that is necessary, you know, in that position because a lot of my clients would go through the, you know, the movement of it, but then they would bounce back up off the joints. And so uh, you would, you would see, you would see them actually relax, you know, down at the bottom position, yeah. uh, which would, was very common because you could sort of utilize that, that elastic spring effect. And then, you know, and that's something we're trying to to teach against because, you know, the, the more you load now, like it's going to compromise the joints, you know, down the road. So I'd looked at it as a great way to then, you know, teach so now I'm at this bottom position. I have no momentum to spring up off of. How do I get up? You have to, you know, really utilize your central nervous system, you know, recruit you and tight. squeeze. You got to be tight. Mm -hmm. Your muscles have to be really involved that way. All right. Next question is from Bear Bowen. What are some causes of the obesity epidemic? Oh, man. <laughs> Did you see my post that I, I, I like to, to pull and trigger people no wait which one was it it was on that the study that you said you shared in the intro today the 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 obesity the uh, i actually i don't think i shared it no you talked about on the intro to did the I show did i talk about yeah yeah we okay. talk, didn't we talk about the show i don't think so i don't know no i don't think we did oh we didn't no 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 oh, we talked I, about it i was gonna we, bring it up yeah uh, we talked uh, about it before oh uh, so there's i mean we should talk about it right now then there's a you know somebody shared in our forum a really a great article i shared it in my stories uh earlier the last week and it's showing that by 2030, that more than 50% of our country will be considered obese. If we just keep if it on- it stays on the trend. Which, I mean, it's we're, it, we're not slowing down. Yeah, we're it only, doesn't look like any of the it's trends slowing down. The trend's technically speeding up. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, it looks like that that's the direction that we're going. Um, and so uh, I on my poll, I did a poll saying that, do you think that the- uh, healthy at every size oh, is yeah, yeah, is yeah, yeah. positively affecting this or negatively affecting Everybody it. Everybody said negative. Uh, you know, there's a lot of people that there's four percent of my following that disagreed. Well, it's, so I, what, you know what's happening? We offended of somebody on that last topic, by the way. I'm sure we did. Yeah, I pissed somebody off when I went on when I went on my rant about how terrible I think it is. It's not the cause of the obesity epidemic, by the way. I don't think that's the. Case oh no, you're, no, you're no, right. no, no. I think what ends up happening is when you get enough people um, that that are in a category. Then they start to it, it's they start to demand being treated a particular way or whatever, you know, uh, you know like when airlines get sued and uh, you know they're changing the size of chairs now they're saying changing this like extra larges aren't the same size as they used to be extra larges now are far yeah they bigger start than they to normalize it on all, because, all levels well and it, because it comes because it's normal when yeah. half of everybody is obese right it is a normal thing right true um, well okay so I have uh, there's been a lot of theories as to what is caused now of course if we boil it down we really break it down we're not burning as many calories and we're eating more calories and that's a duh right but why what is ex exa what exactly has happened to cause that so there's there's two things the, the the lack of burning calories well that's an easy one life has gotten much easier things have gotten automated um, you don't you know washing clothes now we're not done by hand we don't have to carry jugs of water everywhere. Uh, jobs are typically behind a desk now where they used to be very, very physical. So we're just, daily life is just far more sedentary. But I don't think that's the main cause of obesity. In fact, when they do studies on that, they find that the lack of calorie burn has a small, uh, maybe a small part to blame of the obesity epidemic. Really, the big chunk is how much more we eat. Yeah. I think it's I think it's really the combination of the two of them, right, though? Because you're right. Like, when, when you look at... It's far easier to sit down and overconsume 700 calories than it is to take a daily habit that's changed now by 700 sure. calories, right? Like even somebody who, let's say, like a, a, a carpenter versus a engineer at work all day long, you know, the the carpenter doing a physical activity, and by the way, his body starts to adapt to that after he's been in carpentry for after six. They're months. not burning as many calories as you think. They're not. They're not yeah. burning that many more calories uh, more than the engineer who's. They're sitting. healthier. Right. Exactly. Yeah. But they're not burning that many calories. So that's the reason why that study is true. When you read mm -hmm. that, that you're right. But I think the combination of a sedentary lifestyle with 
the overconsumption and how easy it is to consume calories is just well, the fucking recipe for disaster. What you end up, what you have is, you know, and we'll start with America because we started the trend, right? When we talk about, um, you know, you know, Western dietary practices that are contributing yeah, we're to number obesity. One. America started it. Now, how did America start it? Why is it that way? Okay, so America uh, became one of the wealthiest countries, the fastest, and we have we had some of the best markets in the world. And what do markets do better than anything? Give people what they want. They yeah. give people what they want. So if if people really value, uh, you know, shoes, then the market's going to produce a shit ton of awesome shoes. If people really value the way food tastes, if that's what we value the most, more than anything, is I want food that tastes really good, the market is going to create as, that as much as possible. The second thing that Americans or that people in general really value is convenience. We want tasty food that doesn't take a long time to make. In fact, I don't want to make it. I want to buy it and I want to be able to eat it. And so we have this, this huge flood of hyper palatable processed foods that started to come into the market. And so that's the main cause of obesity because that's what causes people to eat more uh, food. Now we used to think it was sugar, carbs, fat. Uh oh, you know, people are eating too much fat. We got to make everything low fat. And then what do food manufacturers do? They find a way to make food tasty without fat yeah. by adding more sugar. Oh no, it's too much carbs. Cut the carbs out. So then food manufacturers figure that out and they're, oh, fat's okay now. Well, let's make food with, with fat or whatever. The bottom line is super hyper palatable foods encourage you to eat more. That's what they do. They're designed to do that. And they do it in such a way that it's almost, I hate to use the word unfair, but your body's natural ability to tell you to, okay, it's, you've had enough food, it gets a little hijacked. And studies now show that people will eat about five to 600 more calories a day when given access to hyper palatable processed food versus whole natural food. Even when people aren't, they're not counting macros or anything, they're just going about their day, you'll eat five or 600 more calories of processed food than you will other foods. So when you look at the, the rise of obesity in America and you slap on top of that a chart of hyper palatable processed food penetration in the market, they match. Uh, Americans used to eat homemade dinners and those started to kind of fall out of favor, more and more processed food. Homemade breakfast, homemade lunch, homemade dinners, those started to fall out of favor, more and more processed food. As that started happening, more and more obesity. And it's just, and every time another country adopts our, uh, you know, these types of foods, you look at Mexico, for example, their obesity exploded over two decades. They went from having no obesity to becoming one of the fattest countries uh, in the I world. Also, I also think that have, us having obese kids now is greatly contributing to that. Oh. I mean, just a couple decades ago, that was rare. It, it was, spreads everywhere. It was rare to see a child uh, under the age of 10 or 12 that would be literally like obese, mm -hmm. where it's extremely common now. And I think a lot of that has to do, and you know, to, again, kind of debate the, the movement point, because... You know, I, I was a kid who could get, I ate a lot of, I ate shitty food and candy as a kid growing up and I got away with it as a kid because I was extremely active. Yeah. I was playing all the time. Like now they, like they all day, all day, yeah. all day I was yeah. playing. Like I, you, my parents would have to settle me down, like sit me down or bring mm -hmm. me in the house. Like I was not sitting on a phone or on a computer or an iPad all day long and then also mm -hmm. shuttling all that crap. Yeah, I was eating Slurpees and having candy and and, eat, and eating desserts and I was doing a lot of that stuff as a kid, but I was also digging holes and building forts and well, fucking playing tag and playing flag yeah. football. Like, I mean, all day long. Yeah, to me, it seems like we started out like we, we've solved all these problems for adults in, in their jobs, like less, you know, laborious jobs that we had to do. And like, now we can, now we can kind of sit in the con, you know, in the comfort of our own chairs and on, on screens. And, you know, now it's trickled into to play. And, and you see this a lot with kids now where it's like, you know, lots of the entertainment and the excitement is revolves around video games. It revolves around, you know, whatever the latest social media thing is that they can interact with, you know, and they're just not outside being interactive, like in, in, and using their body to do things as much. It, it, and, but there's another part to that. Yes, you burn more calories because you're playing all day, but you're also too busy to eat. So at when, right, when, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's yeah. For, because yeah. when I was a kid, if we were out all and day that's long, why the, that's I wasn't why, snacking. That's all day why long. the study of of showing that like oh, when you look at it, just like how many calories more they're burning, it doesn't really affect. It, it's also affecting that you don't have time to sit in front of and eat yeah. and sitting in front of a fucking uh, a screen. 
being sucked into a video game. And the pantry's right there. Right. I mean, when, much easier to sit well, there and suck on sodas. Dude, and even like these, like I, my kids are in sports and like half the kids will come in, their parents will give them all this junk food and shit to fuel, quote unquote, their activity, mm -hmm. you know? And so it's like they're getting activity, but now they're, they're pumping them full of like cookies and all this bullshit before they even get started. Dude, my mom used to have to chase my siblings around to make them eat. They yeah. just have to chase them to eat because they didn't want to stop playing. Yeah, that's how we were. So, right? like, we, you'd eat breakfast and then you'd be playing. Right. And then lunch, you'd come in and eat whatever your mom made you'd real quick. You'd come in just starving, like, ah. And you'd eat it real fast and get the fuck out. Yeah. yeah. Well, if you're on your computer or on an iPad all, or watching TV all day long, yeah, you're the, shoveling food while the you're. The food's right there. Yeah. The food, and you're mindlessly eating. And then, of course, the, the again, it's it, and 100%. I, I place most of the blame on the hyper palatable food. Now, this. Now, this makes the argument for why people need to be healthy. Because remember, markets reflect what people want. And when anytime we look at markets and we think, oh my gosh, this is terrible. Why are we making these things? Why are we feeding ours? Because we're paying for it. If, we, if, if humans were truly healthy in the, in, the, in the fullest sense, the decisions that we would make and the, value that we would, the values we would have would push the market to make things that were better for us. So if everybody valued real whole foods and if everybody really understood the true value of food and, and, and wanted to be healthy and enjoyed eating certain healthy things because they love themselves, the market would go in that direction. But the problem is people have a bad relationship with food. Food is a way to make yourself feel better about your emotions or your anxieties. You only value food for its taste. Ask somebody, you know, next time you go out with your friends and you say, hey, what do you guys want to eat for lunch? 100% of the decision is based off of what they is going to taste the best. N none of it's going to be like, oh, you know what? I, I, I think I really need to eat some you know, vegetables for my digestion or, yeah, I'm feeling kind of low energy. It's always like, oh, I don't feel like Mexican. I feel like, oh, you know, it's really good. Let's try eating. It's all based off of the taste. So when you go to the grocery store, all of the foods that were made and manufactured are all, I mean, all the money goes into making them as tasty and enjoyable to eat as possible. Not inherently a bad thing, but if that's all you eat, you're going to eat more. Yeah. And that's 100% what caused. And again, when you look at countries that adopt this, the more processed foods they start to eat, the fatter, the fatter society gets, and sicker yeah. they get. Um, and again, Mexico is a phenomenal example. It was like 20, 30 years ago, obesity was rare in Mexico. Yeah. Today, I believe Mexico is uh, either mirroring America's obesity rate or might even have surpassed us because they started to eat adopted. I've heard this from a lot of immigrants coming in and, and culturally, like getting into like the way Americans are eating with the pro. It's it just like, it, like totally affects them like all of them get obese and i don't want to i don't want to demonize processed food because by by no means does a day go by that i don't have something that's processed sure so yeah. i want to i want to make that clear but you're aware yeah so I, I think it's just that but a bulk of my food still comes from whole foods mm -hmm. what happened was we went and we we came up in a time where we're at one point we were mostly eating whole foods then processed foods came in and then it, it went from being whole foods a little bit of processed food whole foods then half processed foods Whole little bit of whole foods, mostly processed food, to now all processed foods for a majority of people, right. and that's where we went really wrong. It's not that you can't have something because so much is processed. Our protein powder is processed yeah. that we talked about today. That's processed, right? Yeah. So there's so many things that are processed. And, and, and processed foods allow food to be transferred and moved, and it right. allows them, and it, it's fed a lot of people. There's a lot of value to it. Uh, but I think you have to be aware. You know, yeah, you just gotta. You just have to be aware of how much of it, it, and if it's making up a bulk of your day and a bulk of your, your eating. It, it should be you mostly have to be conscious of it now, right? It needs to be mostly whole foods, and then you and then you use those processed foods. I think it, it, the uh, occasion when it makes the most sense. It's one of the main reasons why I fear the demonization of meat that we're starting to see in a lot of these documentaries and stuff is because a lot of people aren't aren't gonna go vegan for the right reasons. They're going to just avoid meat. And if you look at the typical person's diet, the typical American's diet, it's mostly processed food, but the very few things that are unprocessed tend to be what? Chicken, meat, eggs, milk. So right. then they're going to be afraid of those things. And now you've eliminated all their yeah, whole natural all food. Processed now it's 100% yeah. uh, processed food. If you look at Europe, for example, Europe's obesity rates are climbing, right? Starting to match ours. But one country in Western Europe kind of fell behind with the obesity, and that was Italy. For a long time, Italians had one of the, some of the lowest. Now, it's not like that anymore. Their obesity has climbed quite, quite high or starting to climb pretty high. But they had low obesity rates compared to other countries. Part of the reason for that is because Italians are – they have a pride in homemade foods. They have a culture around it. So they resisted 
for a long time the processed food culture. Now they didn't win. Uh, processed food has won, and obesity among Italians now is is going through the roof, including Shift children. Shift made its way. But I, I remember <laughs> this is it's, I remember there was a, a story I read a long. This was maybe 15 years ago, where a McDonald's opened in a town in Italy, and the Italians protested it, and made it shut down because <laughs> they because wow. they're so like, no, we love our homemade you know food or whatever. Right. But it actually protected them from obesity for for a little while now. Now that now they're they're climbing, it's a little terrible. Uh, and with that, go to mindpumpfree.com and download all of our resources and guides. They're free. They cost nothing. Mindpumpfree.com. You can also find all of us on Instagram. You can find Justin at Mind Pump Justin. You can find me at Mind Pump Sal and Adam at Mind Pump Adam.